Hello, I'm Landon Mueller, one of the faculty members of the consortium, and I'm excited to talk to you today about reductions. We're going to go over the basics of reductions, and then we're going to go through several joint specific reductions, go over some of the techniques and the indications. But first, we're going to start off talking about some of the basics. Why do we even care about reducing an injury? Well, it typically comes down to three goals that we're trying to accomplish. Number one is reducing patient discomfort. Um, these, any joint dislocation or fracture that is dislocated causes a pretty significant amount of pain. By reducing it, we're improving pain for the patient, and that is a huge goal. Goal number two is to reduce any further damage. If you think about a dislocation or a fracture with dislocation, that there can be significant soft tissue damage. By reducing it, we're reducing any further soft tissue damage. And then we want to improve anatomic alignment. And this is for a couple different reasons. One is that with certain, certain reductions, if we obtain anatomic alignment, that can be the definitive treatment. Think a shoulder dislocation. Um, additionally, sometimes with things like distal radius fractures, if we achieve anatomic alignment and it's good enough alignment, and depending on the patient and the circumstances, that may be the definitive treatment that's needed. So these are the three goals with any kind of reduction that we're achieving or attempting. So let's put this into a couple real world examples. This is an anterior shoulder dislocation. When we are reducing this, we are trying to achieve all three of these goals. When we reduce the shoulder, it, it reduces the patient's pain, it stops any further damage from occurring, and it achieves that definitive treatment with anatomic alignment. Versus a situation like this, which is a likely trimal ankle fracture, um, which this needs to be reduced and it needs to have better anatomic alignment, but it's not the definitive treatment. Ultimately, this is still going to need surgery, but by reducing it, we're at least improving the patient's pain and we're reducing any further soft tissue damage. So think about those three goals with um, any reduction. And then specifically for us as sports medicine providers, why should you attempt to reduce on the sideline? Well, the first three reasons are the goals that we've already talked about, reducing pain, reducing further damage, and improving anatomic alignment. But there's two other reasons. Another reason is time. Uh, I'm an ER doctor, and I find that once patients come to the ER, once there's been you know a 30-minute transportation time, sometimes even longer, that those reductions are often harder to perform. And my theory is that with a longer time to reduction, you allow muscle spasm to set in from pain, you allow worsening pain to set in, uh, which makes the patient more difficult to work with. And with some fractures, dislocations, a hematoma can arise, which can make a mechanical block to your reduction. So if you notice a dislocated shoulder on the sideline and you're able to put that back in, oftentimes it's much easier to put that back in when you do it on the sideline versus half an hour by the time they get to the emergency department. So you're doing your athletes a, a big favor by being able to perform these skills. And then finally, you may have a patient with compromised neurovascular status, and this is something that you have to check on all your patients. And so if you do have um, a, a patient or an athlete uh, who has a joint dislocation or a fracture with dislocation, and you know on your neurovascular exam that they have reduced pulses, they have reduced color, they're having numbness and tingling, and you have the ability to reduce it, then you should do that to help improve the neurovascular status. So again, these are kind of the five reasons why you need to learn these skills and why they are important for reductions on the sideline. Going through a couple joint specific um, dislocations and reductions. So a patellar dislocation always occurs or primarily occurs with the patella being dislocated, dis dislocated to a lateral position. And this is usually a pretty easy and fun reduction. Uh, what you do as the provider is you apply medial directed force against the patella while also extending their leg. So oftentimes these patients come in with a slight flexion to their leg with the patellar dislocated laterally. You just apply pressure to the patella while you have um, the patient try to extend their leg or you have an assistant gently passively extend their leg. And those two motions in com combination often slide that patella right back in. Most of the time, this does not require any sedation. Um, patients tolerate it pretty well. So this is something that you can very easily do on the sidelines. Finger reductions. Um, these are some things you can see in ball carrying sports, uh, American football, 
rugby, and even things like basketball and, and other sports. Um, finger reductions are typically what you'll see is the distal phalanx, and it's more commonly to dislocate dorsally than volarly. If you have lidocaine, uh, then I would recommend uh, performing a digital block to provide pain control, but oftentimes these are pretty well tolerated because they're quick reductions. All you have to do is apply traction to reduce it. Sometimes if you kind of reproduce the uh, dislocation, so if it's dorsally angulated, if you just move the phalanx just a little bit more dorsally, that oftentimes will unlift the bone and allow you to then reduce with a little bit of traction. These are often very satisfying. You kind of get a little bit of manipulation, apply traction, and they usually pop right back in. Um, if you're unable to reduce, however, then you need to consider that there may be an, an avulsion fraction involving the joint, and that's applying a mechanical block. There may also be a trap tendon or a volar plate injury, and that could be affecting your block. So at that point, you may need to refer to get x-rays or refer to the emergency department. Uh, and then definitively managing these, you apply a splint. Um, if it's a volar dislocation, it needs to be in, in full extension. If it's a dorsal dislocation, uh, you can basically just apply buddy tape, and these um, heal pretty well over the course of about four weeks. Shoulder dislocations. Um, there have been over 50 methods of shoulder dislocations or shoulder reductions described in the literature. These are just a handful of some of the ones that um, are, are more commonly used, and we'll go over a few of them. So the Stimson method is where you have the patient up lying prone, usually on a stretcher or a table, and you take the dislocated arm and you apply weights to it. Um, just some traction weights that we have in the emergency department or whatever you have available in the training room. You kind of tie it off to their hand so they're not having to grip onto it. Instead, it's just um, the, the weight is going through their wrist. And then this applies gentle, steady traction. And you can allow the patient to just lay there for 10, 15 minutes. And oftentimes that weight, what it does is it um, essentially causes the patient to relax and for the muscles to fatigue, which then allows the shoulder to pop back in. You can also combine the Stimson method with scapular manipulation, which we'll talk about in just a second. And that's where I've had very good success, uh, where you as a provider also apply that scapular manipulation in uh, concert with the Stimson traction. Scapular manipulation is where you're basically applying a medial force through the scapular wing. And what that does is it essentially aims to move the glenoid fossa back into a more anatomical position and allow that humeral head to fly back in. So this can be done uh, basically in conjunction with any other method. So when I use an external rotation or a Cunningham technique, I often have an assistant with me apply scapular manipulation at the same time. And just like I mentioned, you can use the Stimson method and apply scapular manipulation. I like to think of this as an add-on for your other techniques. Milch technique is basically where you take the arm and you abduct it and rotate the palm towards the ground, and then you externally rotate at the end as you're moving that arm in abduction. This one can be pretty painful without some kind of uh, analgesia, whether that's full-on sedation or a hematoma block, uh, but it can be effective. External rotations is one of my personal favorites, especially if I have done uh, an intraarticular block or uh, some other form of regional anesthesia. Uh, it can also work with patients who have no, um, no analgesia, but are fresh on the sideline. I've had pretty good success with this as well. And basically you just take the arm with the elbow kind of at 90 degrees, and then you just slowly externally rotate. And that kind of uh, rolls the humeral head over the glenoid and slips it back in. And again, you can combine this with some scapular manipulation. Ferris technique uh, is a, a technique where you kind of alternate and oscillate uh, with continued traction as you abduct the arm to 90 degrees with some external rotation. Uh, so you can kind of see a theme with all these methods is that they usually involve some kind of external rotation and abduction to mechanically get that glenoid to slip over back into the uh, or sorry, to get the humeral head to slip over back into the glenoid fossa. And then traction counter-traction is one of the oldest methods. Um, this one, however, really is not useful unless you're doing it under sedation, just because it's a fairly violent method um, that can cause a lot of pain. You can apply kind of steady traction, but again, a lot of times this is pretty painful, uh, but something to keep in, in your toolbox. Moving on to elbow dislocations. Elbows almost always dislocate posteriorly meaning that the 
um, elbow is located dis, uh, posterior relative to the humerus. Um, and so this can happen with uh, any kind of trauma, but most, most often with a fall on an outstretched hand. And basically, how you reduce it is by applying traction in the opposite direction. So you can have an assistant applying traction at the olecranon, uh, while you have another assistant applying traction uh, downwards. Um, this is oftentimes, uh, if you don't get to it right away on the sideline, oftentimes then you'll need um, sedation. And these patients will need imaging as well to make sure that there aren't any concurrent fractures associated with it. Uh, but if it was just a standard dislocation, patients can be placed in a sling and then immobilized for two to three weeks uh, before following up. Hip reductions. Uh, these can happen with violent um, sports, think uh, football, uh, motorsports, things like that. They're just like shoulder. There's been multiple uh, reduction methods that have been described. Um, basically, there's an external rotation method with some anterior traction. There's also a Stimson method for the hip reduction, uh, where you have the patient kind of lie prone on a table with their um, legs hanging off the side. Um, I find this one to be somewhat impractical versus kind of the one that um, I think a lot of emergency room and orthopedic surgeons have kind of taken to heart, which is the Captain Morgan technique, which uses leverage. Um, basically, you take the patient's hip and you wrap their um, lower extremity around the top of your knee, and then you apply a downward force through their distal leg. And that uses um, basically a lever to apply force upward to bring their hip uh, into reduction. So this is the Captain Morgan technique. There's some good YouTube videos to watch on that if you're interested. And then with any reduction, um, we mentioned before, you need to assess neurovascular status beforehand to see if you need to do an urgent reduction uh, and then always recheck neurovascular status afterwards. Immobilization is super important because while we talked about you know some of the five reasons why you may want to reduce a fracture or a dislocation. It doesn't matter if you reduce it, if it pops right back out. So immobilization is super important. That's a separate lecture. Um, but the goal should be to um, obtain a reduction and then maintain the reduction with immobilization. And then, of course, have close follow-up for most of these patients. Thanks for talking with you guys.